So let me just make sure. Have you guys been getting emails from me at all? The first mail was only one. Yeah. Is that right? The one that asked us to join the group, that's the only one. Even assignment two? No. no emails. Really? <laughs> All right, so that, that tells me why I'm not getting any response. And I, I supposedly had office hours yesterday, but <laughs> nobody turned up. So I was wondering what happened. Uh, OK, OK. So well, see, I strangely, OK, so nobody got this email. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> OK, September 21st. That was a couple of days ago. Hmm. Okay, so I need to figure out what's going on. That, sorry about that. I didn't. I thought it's going through, and uh, uh, huh. even if we check the group, the group does not have any messages on it. Like huh. Even if you directly go to the group and check it, even then you don't have it. Wow. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I think a few of you had also individual emails. Uh, let me see. Have you been getting any replies from me? Some, some of the individual repl replies, yeah. but I think maybe there's something, something the matter with the Google groups. <coughs> okay, yeah, sorry about that. I thought we are, uh, um, I mean, uh, yeah, I should have gotten worried that as nobody was getting back to me, so. <laughs> but I thought everybody was finding the assignments easy or whatever, and no office hours. Anyway, so I spent a few hours waiting yesterday, and <laughs> nobody turned up, and I think, well, maybe students are doing very well. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I'll take care of it. Sorry about that. So okay, the uh, uh, maybe then it's a bit too late to announce, but uh, we do have a extra makeup class today from six to seven thirty. I know a couple of you have said you cannot make it, but uh, how does it look for the rest of you? It's a little short notice. <laughs> Was that? It is a short notice, except there were many notices which didn't quite make through, I think. Uh, and I mentioned that it's here in this room and uh, such and such things. But yeah, I didn't realize that it uh, 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 hasn't gotten through. Is yeah. it not possible to be a little earlier, like 5 o'clock? It is a uh, seems or you have any conflict. I mean, we'll like, get some food and all that. But it's, uh, I tried a few other things uh, with time, but it doesn't work. So, so. Uh, I was going to do a, maybe a one or two demos in the class. I mean, it's not so much of uh, new material as much as a couple of few demos and experiments and such things of uh, laser and some you know non uh, uh, basically broadband emission. We do some measurements and demonstrate it here. Some maybe beam spreading and and uh, diffraction and a little bit of uncertainty principle and that sort of thing. So we wanted to do it in the class today. Yep. Yeah, uh, for this extra class, I think that uh, makes sense because it's um, some of you cannot make it. But uh, uh, those of you can make it, please be here. That's all I can say at this point. And yeah. Video not being uploaded on the video. No, no, no. It won't be available uh, uh, because uh, we're not editing it uh, on the go and all that. Uh, but I know many of you have asked. Uh, one of the primary reasons that Cliff and I decided not to do that is because it essentially encourages people not to come to class anymore. And uh, that's not the intention of the video note. But uh, the thought is, at some point later, we will post it if you want to review things. Uh, but not after every lecture. We're not doing that. Now, if there are uh, cases where uh, you're missing for valid reasons for cl classes for, you know, uh, um, for maybe you have to travel, for interviews or whatever, uh, we can make uh, exceptions, but only on a case-by-case -case basis, not for everybody. So there was a question. Yeah. Is it possible to uh, upload all lectures before you? Uh, 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 the thing is, uh, we were actually planning to do that, except uh, uh, you will spend a good, uh, good amount of 10 or 11 hours watching them <laughs> instead of preparing for other courses too. Right? Yeah, well, I, I don't think they're that spellbinding to watch, but still, uh, if you watch all of them, it's going to take up a lot of time and you don't realize. But we, we could do that. You know? Uh, especially because of the extra class today, we'll uh, we'll be recording the extra class I think today, right? And uh, um, and then so because it's an in not during the normal class hours, we will record it, and then we might just do the entire chunk of everything till now, 
upload it. We might give access to everybody. So, yeah. Right. More questions? Yep. Yeah. Right. So it's a good question. I was going to discuss that as the first thing today. Uh, there were quite a few questions. In fact, I. It's also buried in one of those emails that went vanished into the black hole. I think. Uh, so the prelim uh, is on next Friday morning, right here in the room in this hour. Uh, and uh, uh, the topics that will be covered in the prelim will be all the way till uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, this uh, kind of chapter six of the book, but uh, uh, not uh, the entirety of chapter six. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, so chapter six on the, is on resonant optical cavities, and uh, Professor Pollock. Uh, Actually, Cliff did discuss this in the last class. You know, defined a lot of parameters, you know, FSR, uh, finesse, and cues, and all that stuff. Right? He defined them in the last class uh, about resonant cavities. So um, we'll basically uh, give you uh, uh, maybe two problems or two and half uh, uh, problems. Two of them would be kind of very similar to what you have been doing in assignments. You know, if you look at the chapter and problems of the book or the your assignment problems very similar to that you know and and uh, it won't be uh, something very different where essentially you can kind of guess what it will be some maybe cavity some maybe uh, ca calculate uh, uh, you know maybe q knots uh, and omega knots and all that sort of thing right and design it so that it's stable or something like that you can kind of guess what we have covered till now we're going to ask you that now, uh, resonant optical cavities, uh, uh, I think uh, the fact that the ideas have already been discussed, though I have not asked you to solve too many problems from this chapter yet, uh, uh, we will kind of, uh, I'm saying that we'll cover, maybe you can consider, just be aware of what's in this chapter. We won't kind of probe you very uh, deeply about the concept of this chapter, but everything before that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Chapter four has not been covered. Oh, yeah. Sorry, forgot. No chapter four cross that out. We are not, we're not doing chapter four. Uh, it's not like uh, um, the concepts are very alien, actually it flows, but we decided to leave it out because uh, it goes into far more details into beam shapes and all that, which uh, I think for, uh, for this class we don't in intend to cover. Uh, uh, so chapter four, leave it out. One through, you know, one, two, three, five, and just be aware of six. Just look through it. It's six is primarily definitions and all that. It's not uh, uh, okay, so that's that's prelim. It'll be a written exam, uh, uh, basically 50 minutes in the class uh, next Friday. And the second thing is, uh, uh, Cliff will do a review of uh, 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 essentially a, a review for the exam on Wednesday next week. So the Wednesday class, no new things, just review, solving some problems, addressing <coughs> questions, and all that from you. Okay, so that's we will do that as well. So uh, our goal really in this course has been to uh, kind of get, uh, get to the laser as fast as possible because what happens in many courses, you end up like three and a half uh, uh, months towards the end of the semester and you still haven't completely seen the laser, right? So essentially we have been trying to get to the laser as soon as possible. So we're kind of going through, uh, running through the first few chapters, but I think you have seen most of these concepts before. so with not spending too much time. If you do have uh, uh, concerns and questions, please come by. As I said, and some of you are already using some of the office hours, if, if the emails get through and if you know when it is. So, uh, uh, but, uh, 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 okay. So in that, in that uh, spirit, what we are, I'm going to do today, and maybe Cliff a little bit in the next class, is to finish up Basically, the entire, all the boxes that we need to take to understand the laser, we started with uh, uh, understanding propagation of electromagnetic waves and uh, um, uh, how uh, any laser beam that has a finite spot size must not be a plane wave. A plane wave has no diameter, right? It's, uh, it's all spread out. So you form Gaussians and then you see Hermite Gaussians and all that and you have the beam propagation, then we defined all, all kinds of parameters. All that was electromagnetic theory and understanding how light uh, 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 can, can uh, um, maintain coherence, maintain uh, uh, finite beam width, etc. Uh, for, uh, uh, and to, to make the region of, I mean, uh, the active part of the laser. And then we designed uh, cavities, stability of those, essentially mirrors, and how, how to deal with them mathematically, ABCD parameters, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
And the last thing that uh, Cliff was covering was resonant optical cavities. And uh, uh, what you guys covered really was uh, defined uh, uh, um, that, that uh, uh, once you have uh, created, uh, if you want to make a laser, we need to have uh, define our frequencies. And the way you choose out those frequencies is by, by your uh, optical resonator, right? So, so uh, you put it inside uh, 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 mirrors and, and then let's say distance is D. And uh, I think if uh, described in great detail, uh, you can only fit a half number of, yeah, sorry, integer number of half wavelengths inside. And that immediately gives rise to this FSR, right? The uh, free spectral range. Uh, and uh, uh, if, you, if you actually do remember, this is the thing we had also done kind of in the first class as well. So we kind of trying to show uh, that if you have a mirror and light bouncing back and forth, you will have uh, uh, these modes that are allowed, right? these modes that are allowed. And only if your reflectivities of the two mirrors are in uh, basically a unity, you have that, right? Meaning they're infinitely sharp, right? Only certain wavelengths can fit. But the moment it's less than unity, which is, reality, which is the reality reflection, uh, the reflectivity is not quite one, then what do you get here? What happens to these you know, modes? So, right. so it broadens, right? Except the very important thing is, is uh, uh, well, if you, if you plot uh, transmission and all that. So essentially it broadens, so depending upon reflectivities, right? And then the, the lower the reflectivity, the broader it is, right? And you have formulas for full at half maxes. So what I'm now plotting is instead of the mode, you can plot physically the transmission, meaning I have light incident on this side. You're like, what, what are we doing? How can you couple in light from a mirror? But remember, the reflectivity is not one, right? That means you can let some transmit through. You can have light come in from here. You can have a you know, light source here too, generate your light. Uh, but then some of it transmits through. And I think you went through all the, all the facts that it will bounce back and forth and add up all your electric field components. Uh, and then when you add them all up, uh, you get uh, how much of it how much of the light energy stays inside the cavity and how much of it makes it outside, which is the transmission, right? Through the cavity, sorry. So this is what we are plotting, the transmission as a function of uh, wavelength times d, which is, uh, I think you call theta. What is k? k is 2 pi over wavelength, right, of the light, of the light beam. And if you plot it now, uh, you see that transmission, uh, if you're, uh, uh, so instead of, well, okay, so I think I'm kind of uh, taking some liberties here. Let's plot it versus theta. And theta now is uh, KD. And in fact, uh, I think you also found that KD is equal to, or 2KD is equal to an integer number times 2 pi is the situation where you'll get the, you know, peak, right? An integer number of half wavelengths, and that's, that's your resonant, resonance condition or KD is equal to an integer times pi uh, and so on. So essentially 2 pi over wavelength is equal to integer number pi, uh, times pi. You cancel those and uh, 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 right. So essentially whenever the cavity length is an integer times wavelength by 2, I think we're kind of running in circles now, but the, you know, that's, that's your condition of resonance. And uh, because of this is an integer, it can be one, two, three, four. It, I think we also saw that for normal, you know, a meter long uh, cavity and uh, say 600 nanometer red, red laser, uh, you have, you know, a couple of million cycles here inside, right? right? So Q can be a million, a couple of million, and then you have Q plus one, Q plus two, and Q minus one, and so on. Right? So what we are doing is plotting the transmission. So theta is K times D. And I think you can see from here that uh, uh, k times d is related to how many integers you have here, right? And it's one of those integers that we're looking at. We are plotting the transmission. And the kind of the almost uh, still, uh, to me, it amazes it. Uh, I, I feel amazed that, uh, uh, you know, no matter what is the reflectivity, uh, uh, no matter, uh, you know, what's the distance, there are some wavelengths at, under which the light essentially comes in and goes through with a tr unity transmission. Transmission is actually one. 
So the peak always stays the same. The transmission peaks raise the same. And uh, if you remember uh, your transmission, you derive these. And you can, you know, kind of, uh, uh, I, I forget all the details. 1 minus r1, r2, square root squared plus 4, something like that, right? And the sine squared theta. Let me just make sure I'm not uh, screwing this up. <laughs> One minus, yeah, yeah, oh, right. So that's the transmission as a function of the wavelength or the function of, uh, uh, you know, theta, which is k times d. I think you see that uh, theta is uh, a mixture of two things, d and lambda, right? The cavity length and the wavelength of the laser that you are kind of shining, so it's a mixture of the two, two quantities. Typically, if you have fixed your wavelength, you're changing your d, in the cavity length, right? And, and then th that's how you're changing or tuning your transmission. But the fact is, I mean, uh, uh, for uh, uh, if, if uh, uh, I, I think Cliff already discussed this, that if under, under that condition, uh, when the, uh, uh, an integer number of half wavelengths fit inside this, the transmission is one. And, and uh, now this is actually a very interesting phenomena. Uh, and and uh, uh, for good reason, it is called resonant and transmission, right? So, and, and the fact that it happens for light was well known for a very long time, you know, I mean, this quarter wave transformers and all that make use of this. So if you have a glass plate here, which has a certain reflection and a certain refractive index and all, I think you know that if you have a quarter wave, uh, quarter wavelength inside or, you know, or, or, or integer number half wavelengths fit inside, you will have perfect transmission for vertical incidence. That's a very well-known fact. For and now for electrical devices, you use this in transformers when you have, you know, a 60 hertz signal going through and you want it to completely transmit, but you also want to amplify a little bit or whatever. You don't want any reflections. You do this as well you know, for electrical signals. So there was a question. Yeah. Is R the reflectivity now? It's uh, mod square of the reflection coefficient. So it's the power. No. So it's not a curvature. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, probably uh, uh, Cliff said that he tried to drill down that ev every parameter that we had earlier is now different, you know. So exactly right. This is reflectivity. So essentially, if your electric field reflected is small r times electric field incident, then big R now is mod r squared. That's what it's the reflectivity. And it's kind of this ratio of n1s and n2s, if you remember, air n1 minus n2. So, uh, unfortunately, this is how you know things are going. I think the most uh, abused notation was small q or something like that, which w used to be the beam parameter, and now it's the integer of the of the. Anyway, it's. Uh, I think uh, you know, with with a more evolved structure of language, we can <laughs> uh, have a more. Uh, uh, Anyway, we have a finite number of alphabets so, and a lot more concepts, so that's where uh, the degeneracy comes in for this. <laughs> All right, so big R here is reflectivity. It's reflectivity. And obviously the max is one. And, uh, and uh, okay, so, so what I wanted to uh, uh, say is uh, this resonant transmission is uh, actually true for uh, not just electromagnetic waves. Uh, so with the advent of quantum mechanics, which will be a part of something we discussed today, uh, it's true for, it's found to be true for particles through as well, for particle transport. If you have particles that have wave nature, and now quantum mechanics says, well, that means it's all of, every particle has wave nature. So an electron going through, if it has, sees a certain kind of barrier, it can actually resonantly go through as well. You know, if the barrier length is an integer number of half wavelengths of the electron wavelength, it can go through, and those would be called resonant tunneling diodes. In fact, uh, uh, that's an electrical device. You can measure them at room temperature. Indeed, you can see the transmissions at room temperature, and they're used to make, uh, just like we use this idea here to make a laser uh, light oscillator, they are used to make electronic oscillators as well. So, so very fast, uh, half terahertz, I mean, very, very fast uh, electronic oscillators. The concepts are exactly the same. You take the electron resonant tunneling diode, put, put it inside another cavity, and you try to amplify, you know, a certain, uh, select out one mode and amplify it again. Right? So, so uh, the one point I wanted to make, which uh, uh, was uh, uh, not discussed, is uh, uh, the main idea of the laser really is, uh, uh, is, is we have the, uh, we have chosen a wavelength, we have chosen a mode now, 
And uh, I think you know now that uh, the gain spectra of, of uh, any, any material you put inside, without the gain, gain medium, there is really no lasing. So the gain medium that you put inside will, pro of, uh, will provide amplification or gain, right? If you have four, you know, uh, n number of photons coming in, you have probably uh, uh, maybe two n number of photons going out of that. So, so that's a fixed gain of two. And that will happen for every pass. Every time the electromagnetic wave goes across, uh, let me sketch it here in a little better way. <clears throat> let's say, let's say that the entire region is a gain medium, it's just a guess. Let's say. I mean, generally it's a part of it, but let's say it's all of it. And so, uh, under, the, under the, that picture, your electromagnetic wave, if I were to plot the electric field, uh, it's going to look, you know, like that, right? And it, I know there's a million cycles, but I'm just doing a finite number. Right? But uh, if I fill it with my gain media, which, may, which means I have maybe some uh, atoms that are providing gain, then this electric field is, start, is going to start to grow. When it moves to the right, the amplitude of the electric field starts increasing. That's the classical picture of a gain media. So essentially, you start kind of going like that. It still meets your boundary conditions and all that, but its amplitude starts growing. That's a classical picture of gain. The quantum mechanical picture of gain is as it goes through, every time you, know, you get a stimulated emission, you get two photons out. So the number of photons is increasing. That's the quantum mechanical picture. As you go to the right, the number of photons is increasing. Classically, the amplitude of electric field is increasing. And both describe the same picture. Not, no difference, really. And, and uh, uh, as a result, we'll say that uh, with one pass, uh, if you remember the if I were to start out here and go here and reflect back and come back here again, right? So that's one round trip, right? If I want to, uh, so I, I travel uh, um, by J two times k times d. So that's my normal phase that that I accumulate, right? Uh, and then you have these two uh, reflections. Uh, I think you talked about gamma one, gamma two. In fact. Uh, yeah, so reflectivity, right? Gamma mod gamma squared. That's the reflection coefficient, gamma. So I, th I think those things you saw, but this was all without gain. So you, you have an incident electric field, and then it goes across. The amplitude stays the same, but you uh, uh, the moment you hit this, you get, you get a little reduction in amplitude. You hit that, you get a little more reduction in amplitude, and this is the total phase. So that's the electric field. But the moment I introduce a gain medium, Every time I go through uh, a path like that, my electric field is going down because of these reflections and losses. What, what do the reflection uh, mean? I mean, part of it is leaking out here, part of it is leaking out there. So it's a little bit leaks out. Some photons leak out. Therefore, the electric field amplitude just goes down a little bit. Right? Does that make sense? I mean, that's a classical quantum analogy here. Uh, but uh, now I'm actually feeding in and increasing it, so I have gain too. So this is loss. And then I will have gain now. Okay? And every pass will have a gain. The gain we are going to write, G, it's the power gain. It's not the electric field gain. Just like reflection coefficient, it's the power reflection coefficient. This is the field. Power is square of field. Right? So, so similarly, square root of gain is the increase in electric field. But uh, uh, once I, uh, so, so this is what will happen. So every time I go through once, I increase square root of G because I've made one pass through the system. Then I go back again, another square root of g. So every double pass or a round trip is going to give me a total gain of g naught. Does that make sense? Electric field uh, gain. So if I were to do one pass from left to right, uh, if I have gain, then it's uh, e on the left times square root of g naught. Right? But power. Uh, 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 well, I uh, just say, I mean, o over some length L. I, I'm, I'm not, not uh, uh, going to specify which length. Right? And then obviously, if you do two, uh, two times D, which is you know, one p full pass, then, then I get a twice of that. So this essentially goes as uh, the power law, as you can see. I mean, every, every pass is, is 2D. E every round trip is 2 times D, and that gives you a G naught. Yeah, there was a question here. Yeah. 
So, yeah, so it's just, you get a gain of G0 if, if there's like a round trip. Exactly, yeah. The total gain in a round trip is G0 now. Right? So, and once you take that into account and do the same math that uh, Cliff did to figure out this transmission coefficient, you have a couple of small changes. You will have a G0 here. You, you'll get a G0 here, and I think you can probably see where, you know, essentially you'll get this factor, also multiply that one, and then square them and all that. And then, uh, you know, I, I think I've wrote, written that down there, plus 4G0. That's, that's how it changes. That, those are the three new gain terms that appear, and obviously it was one before, which you couldn't see, you know, because it, there was no gain material, so there was no amplification of photons. So this is the new uh, uh, expression for uh, a cavity, we're getting very close to the laser now because now we're introducing a gain material and this is the transmission coefficient for a light incident from the left, uh, light beam to go through the cavity, to transmit through the cavity if it has gain. So yeah, this question. What is the order of G? Sorry? How large is G? How large is G? Very good point. So a uh, question uh, is how large is G? Uh, uh, so, uh, so if you have no, no, no gain at all, it's one. And uh, uh, typically we'll see you know, something like this would be a good number. We could make it very good by doing this, so it's like 3% or something like that. And it depends. I mean, some materials can have very high gain. Semiconductor lasers typically have much higher gain. But uh, the, the typical numbers are slightly larger than one, 1.0 1 something and all that. I think, uh, yeah, so here's a good example. Uh, from your book again, uh, uh, that if I have, uh, so uh, numbers here are like 1.04, 1.035 and all that. So this, this is uh, from your book showing, uh, uh, what it's showing is if I have one watt of power incident from the left, and uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, if I have no gain and I have one watt of power incident from the left, if I have no gain, meaning G is one, so just remember, no gain doesn't mean loss. I mean, so uh, this media in between, I'm assuming it doesn't have loss inside. There's obviously loss of photons at the two ends that we have taken into account. That's your R1s and R2s. But in the laser cavity, there's no loss. There's only, uh, and then the worst I can do is put gain is equal to one. There's no photon gain, no increase in photon number. In that case, uh, if I have one watt incident on the left, I think I, you, you talked about, Cliff talked uh, in the last class that if I have one watt incident on the left, in steady state, after all the bouncing is done, everything has settled down, you have one watt going out to the right. That's steady state. But what you have here inside is a huge buildup of, of a number of watts inside. It's, it's storing a lot of energy, it's the energy storage. You could have, uh, and that, that's essentially a measure of Q, you can have you know, 1,000 watts inside here. The energy stored here with a lot of lobes and, you know, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so energy, uh, uh, so it's in the, uh, under steady state, if I were to look at power as a function of distance here, here's your mirror, here's your other mirror. So I have maybe one watt incident from the left. I'm plotting power now in space, uh, you know, qualitatively, but, and what I'm saying is, uh, inside the cavity, you have a huge buildup of laser power or electromagnetic power, and then outside, whatever comes in is going out again. I mean, that's that's steady state, but you have a huge, power, a huge buildup. And and uh, if you suddenly turn off this thing, you, you you suddenly turn off your input light source. There's a huge amount of energy still sticking around, but it's not going to stick around forever, right? How long is it going to stick around? That's your photon lifetime. Right. How long is it going to stick around? Basically, again, it's going to do bounce, bounce, but then every time some of it leaks out, leaks out, and there's a finite number of times when it will go to zero. Right? So that's photon lifetime, right? Very similar to a LC oscillator, you know, you get L and C, and then uh, if you have the LC oscillator, uh, you know, the, the essentially, uh, you know, it's oscillating, but then you have the decay because of the resistance. If you turn off your voltage supply, it will decay down, and that's the RC sort of time constant. It, it goes down, right? Very similar to that. The photon lifetime is the equivalent of the RC life, lifetime of any uh, L LCR circuit. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Now, uh, and, and I think you saw that there is a characteristic lifetime, which is uh, the one over your FSR, the free spectral range, uh, meaning two times d over c is the one pass photon time, right? 
and every time you have a certain a reflection, reflection coefficient and all that, so the f photon lifetime looks something like that, right? right? Maybe a f few, and then uh, because you're losing a little bit every time. Now, uh, as you can see now, uh, the uh, moment I put in gain into the system, it's a very different business because uh, if I have no gain, the maximum transmitted power, this is transmitted power, is equal to the incident power. Here, the problem is set up that the incident power is one, one watt. So maximum you can transmit is one watt. You cannot have more. The only way you can have more than what's coming in is if you have gain in the material. So we add gain. Gain goes from 1.0 to 1.02, and you have this as your transmitted power now. Gain is equal to 1.03. This is transmitted. So essentially, by the time you reach 1.035, just put this formula in. This is essentially P out over P in. And if you hit resonance, you are transmitting 9 watts of power with 1 watt in coming in. Right, one watt. So, so the idea is I have one watt coming in here, and what's coming out here is nine watts. And the, how is that possible? That's that's very weird, right? right? So, yeah, there was a question. Wait, so, is there a limit to the amount of gain you can have through power? Uh, um, well, uh, so the, yes, definitely there's a limit, but. Uh, uh, so in principle, at least mathematically, it would look like you can get G is equal to infinity. The moment you put in, you know, uh, rather the transmission, you can, uh, if, you, if your G, if your gain becomes larger than 1 over R1, R2, you can show that this will blow up at resonance when theta is, you know, KD, right? All that it means is, uh, let me first explain this part. How is it that you have more power going out uh, than coming in? Now, remember, gain doesn't come for nothing. I mean, gain, you have to create population inversion. Without, without it, there's no gain. I mean, you don't get gain if you don't have population inversion, which means I have to create inside this region uh, atoms which have an electron that is sitting at a higher energy level than, than, than its uh, equilibrium. So what it means is I have already been, I've been pumping this set of atoms here and creating my gain medium by with a broadband light source, maybe I kind of ex have excited the electrons here. They're all sitting at the excited state. Right? So what does that mean? I have a steady state input of DC power going in just to uh, create the population inversion and create situation conducive to provide me gain. So I have what you can consider if you have draw, want to draw an analogy with electrical gain in transistors and all. You always need to bias the transistor under DC. Your gain is always in AC. So you, you get a small signal in, but the gain comes, basically you are sucking power out of this broadband light source and putting it into this single mode, right? So it's, there's no violation of any energy conservation here, right? So you can have more power going out, but coming in. Why? Because you sucked out power from all these other wavelengths from the broadband light source and you put it into that mode, which you selected by your cavity. You know? So that's the idea of this, right? Does that make sense? So. That's the general idea of any sort of gain medium. I mean, gain is, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, well, of course, it's not violating any energy uh, conservation laws, but that's where it's coming from. And uh, I, physically, you can get very high gain, but typically you'd be limited by uh, things like how many atoms you have that provide gain, right, that will saturate. Uh, if you remember, we did a very quick estimate of, uh, if you look at the mode volume of the laser, it's restrictive, you know, it has finite size and all that. You go from zero, zero mode to higher modes. Uh, then the number of atoms inside there, those things actually limit the gain. It's not uh, so fu And fundamentally, uh, when G0 exceeds 1 over R1, R2, this thing blows up. All that it physically means is now <coughs> you can reach a situation where you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, so remember the laser would have broadband excitation or electrical injection that's providing the energy. And now the picture we started out with is I want to have an incident beam and I have output beam, right? And the beauty of having, uh, uh, you know, when G becomes larger than 1 over R1, R2 is you can have no incident beam and it's still going to output power. Basically, in some sense, you're doing zero times infinity, but not quite. I mean, so all it means is we are pumping in power in we don't need anything input, uh, and so we can turn off our input, and it will still oscillate. You know, so, so it's, a, it's a natural oscillator. It's taking in DC power, converting into one mode. You know? So that's really what it means when it blows up. Right? Uh, is that clear? So, okay, good. So 
uh, and uh, 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 all right so so that, that that's that's uh, uh, important cost and you can get your full at half max with the gain essentially you had g naught is equal to one before and you just you know this is your full at half max you can calculate those things from the same way you take sine theta near your resonance you know theta is like two pi plus a little delta and you can expand that you know all that and you get theta plus and theta minus where does this go to half of it when this term becomes equal to that term you get half and all that so full width half max comes out from there okay so now the main question the biggest uh, uh, physics question now is what is responsible for the gain and I think we have already said it's uh, the spontaneous uh, uh, or sorry stimulated emission and now we're going to start off with the uh, getting into the real heart of the problem and say how how do we uh, write down what is the expression of gain where does it come from and uh, um, and and uh, how do I design materials that have more gain uh, what are the things you have to fight in um, broadening and all that in homogeneous broadening broad so we're going to actually look at the uh, the more quantum mechanical details now of gain right where does gain come from but I want to stress that till now meaning uh, so we are kind of here now <laughs> So if we just finished cavity with gain, uh, I think with a, uh, the, the, the supposed to be an example and I think this was our example that one watt in and nine watts out and all that so that's our example. Okay, so we have essentially finished all things that you need to know to make a laser, you know, cavity, gain, uh, resonance, uh, stability, you know, and understand polymers. But now we get into details of the uh, idea of gain and we start with the quantum mechanics of atomic radiation. So that's what we're going to start with now. This will not be covered in the prelim, so it's definitely out uh, of prelim, uh, but I want to get it started now and, uh, uh, um, and I think uh, on Monday Cliff will continue a uh, little bit of this as well. Okay, so before I move forward, any, f any questions on, on uh, just the idea of, of uh, what we talked about here? Any questions or? And uh, uh, okay, so if if not, let's move move forward with uh, uh, with uh, atomic uh, radiation. And this is uh, again chapter seven. Just want to say that we are, we are we are really following the book uh, closely. So um, it'll do a lot of good if you read it, and I think you, most of you are. So so that's that that's good. So please follow that as well. You can always append it with uh, some other uh, sources uh, to read from. So uh, we get back to something that we discussed in probably second class, uh, which is uh, um, how did the idea of uh, uh, a stimulated emission or gain come from and photon gain. And photon gain comes from first looking at situation where there's no gain, just looking at uh, the classic problem of uh, black body radiation. So uh, uh, here's the black body radiation problem uh, in, in uh, you know, in its uh, Planck version of it. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So I, I have a, see I used to be able to draw proper cubes, but I've, <laughs> uh, all right. So here's a, it's not a cube, maybe a more of a rectangular cavity. Uh, what do we mean by cavity? Well, just think of it as a metal a box uh, and inside it, uh, there's, uh, there's air uh, or, or there's vacuum inside it and uh, uh, the dimensions of this box are uh, A, B, and D. Right? Lengths, you know, the three lengths, A, B, and the length along this direction is D. Right. <coughs> so uh, by whatever means, uh, inside this metal box and then this vacuum inside, uh, I've created uh, uh, electromagnetic waves. I have light inside there by whatever mean, maybe I have a light bulb inside shining or whatever it is. Maybe the atoms uh, are of the metal box are vibrating because of heat or something like that. Uh, and and uh, uh, so, so I have electromagnetic waves uh, going back and forth because these are metals. I think you know right away that it will uh, form standing waves in that direction, standing waves in this direction and standing waves in that direction. Why? Because a metal, inside a metal the electric field is zero, right? Therefore, if I have electric field oscillating, uh, so, so uh, essentially my electric field must go to zero here 
and electric field must go to zero here, so that, that's my boundary condition. It, it's, if you think of electrical circuits, you're, you're, you're shorted here. It's a transmission line, and, and you're basically shorted the end. That, that's what it means, it's the same thing. For light, it's the same thing as an electromagnetic wave in a circuit, it's short. The electric field is zero, here the voltage is zero, right? Same deal. Okay. So uh, now the question of black body radiation is, I create a little tiny uh, opening or a hole here, and let's say this is a large box, and then I, ha I, I, st I put in a spectrometer and measure as a function of say frequency the amount of light wave coming out. So this is really the axis I'm plotting, and then I, I measure the intensity of radiation coming out, light coming out as a function of the frequency a little hole, measure it. And what it'll measure is, well, it's going to look something like that. Right? So, so that, that's how it's going to look. There'll be a peak at a certain uh, frequency, and then it's going to go down. Now, uh, this is a actually not uh, a hypothetical or Gedanken experiment. This is something that Max Planck was doing uh, while he was consulting with the uh, an industry where they were using indeed ovens, you know, real ovens for melting iron, or I forget exactly what it was, but it was where these uh, walls would be at a few thousand, you know, a couple of thousand degrees C or something like that, very hot. Right? And, and then it, they, would, they would essentially were really trying to prevent the loss of heat because they wanted it to be efficient and all that. And all the heat was radiating out as light. I mean, not all the heat, I mean, a lot of it was radiating out as light. But, uh, and then by that time in uh, late 1890s and early 1900s, people had figured out how to build really precise spectrometers. And the reason to build good spectrometers was from astronomy. They were trying to look at, you know, expanding universe and all that stuff. But then they put the spectrometer here and they measure it and it looks like that. Right? And then, uh, so as you increase the temperature, it, it, it actually goes out, it stretches, it goes higher and the peak goes a bit to the right. So, so. So, so it shifts like that. <coughs> the radiation shifts like that if you increase the temperature. Right? So, so that's black body radiation. That's what the word for it, black body radiation. If you're at uh, uh, 4,000 Kelvin, that's how it looks. 4,500, 4, you know, 5,000 Kelvin. Uh, sorry, I, th I think I said it wrong. This peak shifts to the left, and that, that's that's not right. Yeah, yeah, the peak goes to the left. Yeah. And, Anyway, I'm plotting on a little tilted scale here. Uh, so that's black, black body radiation. And way before Max Planck, people already had figured out that if you plot this frequency as a function of any small window of d nu here, you take a little d nu right, and plot how much energy do I have, the so-called so radiation energy density or spectral density. Uh, this people already knew looked like this. I mean, let me just write that down. Uh, uh, 8 pi uh, uh, h bar, uh, not, not h bar, h c cubed, uh, sorry, oh, c cubed times uh, frequency cubed 1 over e to the power h nu over kt minus 1. They already knew it. In fact, they already knew Planck's constant too. I mean, there's, uh, just one sec, so they, they already knew Planck's constant as well because they knew speed of light, they knew the frequency or the wavelength of light, they knew the temperature you're sitting at, so they could extract what is a h. They already knew it was 6 point, you know, whatever that is, 6.63, 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. They already knew that before Planck. So, yep, so question. Is this graph still in frequency? Yeah, it, uh, oh yeah, that's right, I was getting confused, you're right, you're, very good point. In frequency, it does go to the right, you're right. Wavelength, it goes to the left, I was a bit confused, that's right. Frequency, it does increase, this is kind of the peak goes as to the power four, it's the Wien's law and all that sort of thing, so it's a good point. Yeah. It, do, it does uh, increase uh, uh, in, in frequency space. But essentially, the whole thing goes up and the peak shifts. And uh, I think it's always good to remember more is energy, you will always blue shift, you go higher frequency, so, and, and or lower wavelength, that's right, so thanks, thanks for pointing it out. Yeah. So uh, people already knew this uh, energy radiation density, and, and uh, the problem though was uh, 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 electromagnetic theory of Maxwell's equations was incapable of explaining this, that, that was the problem. Uh, Maxwell's equations 
when you put it together with classical thermodynamics, it was incapable of explaining it. And that's what we want to first see why and how did it, how did Max Planck, uh, what hypothesis solved it? I think you, you know, well, spoiler, I mean, of course, we know that energy is not, uh, now we know that energy uh, in every mode of photon is not uh, a continuous number, but it comes in a discrete number of photons in any mode. The moment you make that assumption, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. The moment you say that in any mode of electromagnetic spectrum, if I can have only an integer number of h nu, integer number and not a continuous number of nu, then this falls out right away. Right? But if you don't make that assumption and you say that, well, I have a continuous number, I have thermodynamically kT or whatever, you get these, uh, uh, what's called a Rayleigh genes law, or ultraviolet catastrophe, and all that sort of thing. So, so you're gonna, we're going to see that very easily right now, well, yeah, in whatever time is left now. So, uh, so the idea is uh, uh, very simple. By now, we are experts in uh, realizing that this is actually nothing different from a standard cavity that we've been talking about all the time, right? So this is if I have a distance d, you have your FSR, right? Free, free spectral range. If you are, if your distance of the cavity is along the z direction and your distance is d, then I think you already know your allowed modes are separated by c over 2d. That's your free spectral range, right? Now, all that has happened in this box, it's a three-dimensional version of the same problem, 3d. In this direction, I have length a, so I'll fit an integer number of half wavelengths again in, in a, right? In this direction, integer number of half wavelengths b, Right? And in that direction, an integer number of half wavelengths of D. And that's all there is to it. There are th th three modes. There are three uh, FSRs. So you can kind of plot it now in three directions. Right? So you get a 3D grid of points now. Does that make sense? So you had only Q earlier, only one Q. You had Q, Q plus one, Q minus one, and all that. Now you have, let's call it m is the integer for this and uh, oh, I think Cliff always he wants to use n right so he says New Mexico right n m and maybe p along that direction three integers choose choose anything n and p and uh, your frequencies which is uh, omega let me write that down now uh, I, I can do it, you know, heuristically, that uh, you realize that a half number of integer wavelengths must fit inside there. That's all there is to it, I mean, right? That part is clear. So, uh, uh, so, so essentially, uh, I, I, I would say that uh, for k along x, which is 2 pi over lambda. Now, lambda, I want to write it as lambda x, but I think physically you understand what I mean. It's, it's kind of, if I, if I have a wave going only in the x direction, then this is the wavelength. It doesn't have any y or z component. Then k, uh, uh, so, so uh, what will be the values allowed? n times lambda x over 2 is equal to d. Oh, sorry, is equal to a. a is your x coordinate, right? So that's the uh, n number fit there, right? Similarly, you will have m lambda y over 2 is equal to b and p times lambda z over 2 is equal to d. Right? Three. All, all, all it's saying really is your k's along x, which is 2 pi by this, is now, so let me write down your total k. Total k squared is equal to kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. This is very standard wave fitting. I think you have seen this probably. So kx squared is 2 pi by lambda. So from here you can see 2 pi over lambda x will be, you know, 2 pi by that. So that's n times uh, n by 2a, right? And there's a pi. So, okay, n times pi over a. You can see that from here. And therefore, that becomes uh, pi over a times integer n squared plus m pi over b. You can and kind of run through the rest, it's e e e easy to understand what we're doing, pi over d. So that's your k's, and k's are 2 pi by wavelength, or you can relate it to what I want to do is the frequency or the energy of the photon, right? That's, that's, right? And the frequency and uh, 
k are related through c times k. I think you know that that's for photons, omega is equal to c times k. If you are going in a material medium, you put in your refractive index down there, right? So that's, that's uh, uh, and then omega is 2 pi times your frequency. Right? So take that here. So you just have 2 pi n and all that. So what I'm trying to do is convert from k to frequency, which is uh, 2 pi n over c times nu. So I take this, plot that in there, and I get all my allowed modes, my, all my FSRs in every three direction, I mean, in 3D space. I get all of them now. So, so what does that give me? 2 pi n over c nu whole squared is equal to, uh, okay, let me write this down um, and not to worry about time. <coughs> All right, so <coughs> so uh, uh, you can cancel out your pi's uh, here and uh, uh, let's make another simplicity, uh, simplifying assumption that it's a cube. You know, you, you can go into A, B, D being different. Let's also make A is equal to B is equal to D is equal to A. You know, I mean, or it's a cube. Simplifying assumption. You, you don't have to. You can evaluate it otherwise as well. Uh, uh, I think we're already running into a bit of a problem here because this n is an integer, but you know, maybe I write it like a n hat or something. It's a refractive index here. Yeah. So. <clears throat> okay. So uh, all, all said and done now, you can kind of translate these quantities to the right side. Uh, your pi's go away. Uh, your a's, all, all are a's, so they all go out as a squared here. And uh, uh, the end result of all this is uh, your nu will be, let's write that down, c over 2n a times n squared plus m squared plus p squared, one half. Okay. So you can write it as n, m, comma, p. So these are discrete modes now. Okay. You've got all the points. And uh, big surprise, what's sitting here? What is that? C over 2a. Forget the refractive index. The free spectral range, FSR. Right? And makes sense. I mean, FSR is the spacing between any two modes. So this is spacing, the length scale of those modes, and all these go from zero, you know, to infinity effectively. These are integers, discrete points, and go zero to infinity. Okay, so I'll actually, I just realized we're out of time. So what I'll do is stop here, and just to give you a picture of what we just did, these are all the allowed modes, M, P, Q, uh, I think they have different alphabets now. Anyway, these are integers, and these are all points. If all three integers are zero, you are sitting at the origin. If one of them is one, zero, zero, you are on the x-axis, y-axis, so you have this whole grid of points. And each point here represents one mode of light that fits inside this black body, each mode. Right? And then next we are going to assign energy to each of it and then see how much of it comes out is essentially for each mode weighted by its energy, sum them, you should be able to get this. That's what we're going to do next and then show that uh, that's how it leads to the Planck's uh, hypothesis. Okay. So, uh, 6 p.m. here, uh, those who can make it, I'll see you here. We'll have some pizza and drinks and all that stuff. And, uh, uh, all right, yeah, and your homeworks are here, those who have not collected, the first homeworks uh, are here. Yeah.